Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of The Witcher Chapter by Chapter Book Review, where I'll go through a summary of what happened in the latest chapter and give my detailed thoughts on it. Today I'll be discussing story four, A Little Sacrifice, from book two, Sword of Destiny. I love this story. I talked about this towards the end of the last episode in um, whatever that story was called, Eternal Flame. Yeah, it was. Re it's really overshadowed by this one, at least for me, because... This is my all-time favorite story out of all of them, not just from Sword of Destiny, but including the stories from The Last Wish. I love this one the most. And uh, that means I'm uh, extra excited to talk about it. I'm always excited to talk about these stories, but today it's a special one for me. So uh, let's get into it. We have a recap followed by a summary and then just a general discussion of the story. So to recap last episode, in case you missed it or you need a refresher, in the last story, we had a happy ending for a nice change where the issue of the Doppler doo-doo, assuming the halfling merchant Dainty Beaverveld's form and running his life was resolved. And they, along with Geralt and Dandelion, came to a mutual agreement and set off for a night of who knows what <laughs> at the Bordello, the Pass of Flora. All right. Here comes the summary of this episode's short story. We begin a little sacrifice with Geralt on a boat, working as a translator between the Duke Aglovel of Bremervord and his mermaid almost lover, Shinaz. Aglovel would like Geralt to communicate to her that he has a method for her turning into a human so they can be together on land, but she would rather he turn into a merman and be together in the sea. An agreement is not reached, and much to Geralt's dismay, the Duke refuses to pay him for his services. This is a major problem for Geralt and Dandelion, who accompanied him to the town, since they are completely broke and don't know where their next meal will come from. As Geralt and Dandelion are discussing this issue, they are approached by one of the town's residents, a man named Teleri Drohard, who offers Dandelion a singing gig at his son's engagement party. They agree on a price, and the pair now have access to a meal for the evening and lodging in Drohart's home. At the engagement party, Dandelion introduces Geralt to his old friend, the other troubadour performer, Essie Davin, also known as Little Eye. Geralt mistakenly makes a bad first impression and seems to have offended Essie. Later during the party, when he sees her stepping out onto a terrace alone, he follows her, hoping to make up for what he said. She quickly forgives him, and after a short conversation, Geralt and Essie unexpectedly kiss. Geralt felt incredibly stupid for kissing her, but all is fine when, the next morning, she joins him while he's trying to work on a new job for the Duke Aglovel. Aglovel has asked Geralt to look into what might have killed an entire ship of pearl divers. While Essie and Geralt are talking on the beach, an angry Aglovel approaches, saying he waited for three hours at his usual meeting place for Shinaz to show, but she never did. He's also upset that the Witcher isn't making much progress in finding out what happened to the missing pearl divers, and isn't interested in Geralt's excuse that all the local sailors are too afraid to, to take him out to sea after the recent incident. Shortly after the Duke leaves, Shinaz shows up in the water, stating that she was looking for Aglovel and became angry with him when Geralt informs her that her man waited three hours for her. She doesn't believe he is willing to make even a little sacrifice for her. Later, Geralt is joined during the low tide, closer to where the Pearl Divers were attacked, by Dandelion, who wants to tag along in the hopes of composing a new ballad about the adventure, of course. Dandelion is also looking around for a decent gift for Essie, as her birthday is the next day. The two discover underwater steps that Dandelion decides to investigate, and then stumbles upon cobalt blue shells, and he decides to take one. At that moment, they hear what sounds like a bell coming from under the water. All of a sudden, an armed fish-like humanoid monster splashes out from the surface and tries to attack the Witcher and Bard. Dandelion makes a run for it while Geralt tries to hold the additional fish monsters off. They're all equal to Geralt in speed and strength, so he knows he doesn't have a shot at facing the whole gang of them that appeared. He starts to run for it himself when he falls into the sea and is pulled by his leg deeper into the water. He kicks whatever has hold of him and uses the Ard sign whoop, to push himself back toward the surface. A wave sends him onto a rock where he sees Shinaz was blowing a conch shell horn, calling the fish monsters off. Back at Drewhearts, Essie is helping bandage up the arm wound Geralt received in the fight. Dandelion takes off to meet a young woman and, on his way out, gives Essie the cobalt blue shell for her birthday. 
When she tries to open it, a sky blue pearl falls out. They realize it's extremely valuable, so Essie tries to refuse accepting it, but Geralt insists she take it. She tries to repay him with a kiss, but Geralt awkwardly dodges her. Essie confesses that she loves him, and she fell in love with him the moment she first saw him at the engagement party. Geralt, unfortunately, does not feel the same way. The two sit quietly in the room together until Dandelion returns. The next day, Geralt, Dandelion, and Essie meet with Duke Agilvel to tell him about the intelligent race of fish monsters that attack them and the Pearl Divers. The Duke, once again, is not pleased and stubbornly refuses to pay Geralt because the results were not what he wanted. Essie comes to Geralt's defense, and right after Agilvel dismisses them out of anger, the now former mermaid turned human, Shianaz, enters the room, revealing her lack of tailfin she sacrificed to be with the Duke. From here, the story cuts to an uncertain amount of time later when Geralt, Dandelion, and Essie all leave Bremivord together. One night while camping, Geralt and Essie finally talk about what's going on between them. Geralt talked to her for a long time about his feelings, and the two made love that night. On their final night together before the three of them parted ways, Dandelion stayed up late composing a ballad about the Witcher and Bard and how they fell in love. It's at this moment that we learn he never changed the lyrics with a more accurate depiction of what occurred. He knew no one would have enjoyed a song that explained that the Witcher and Poet never saw each other again, and that she died four years later of smallpox, and Dandelion buried her in the forest with her lute and the sky blue pearl. Ugh, sad. That is such a sad ending to such a good story. <laughs> this story has a lot. Like, you know, there's action, there's kind of romance, there's tragedy. There's a lot going on here. You got this rude character. You know, I talked about this in the um, Shard of Ice short story episode. How. I use the Mayor Herbolf from that story as an example because he was uh, he was just so rude. And I, I was saying, it feels like almost every story, Geralt meets somebody like just like this kind of guy. And Agilvel is, uh, he's probably not as bad as Herbolf. Herbolf was openly racist, <laughs> um, which Agilvel, he might say, he says a few things that might allude to that a little bit, but um, I don't know if we can say that he, you know, hates elves like Herbolf did, but still, he, uh, you know, he won't, he's not willing to pay for jobs, and that was really annoying because one of the, the two jobs that he had Geralt do, and you had him translate between, um, he and Shianaz, we don't know how he asked him to do that job, but at least with the job of Geralt figuring out what happened with his pearl divers, it's never explicitly stated that he wanted him to get rid of whatever monsters were attacking people over there so i mean technically he didn't i don't know it depends on how you look at it but i think that it was bs that he didn't pay carol for that job because Geralt almost died so well anyway essie was a great character it's so sad that she passes away so sad that she had these unrequited feelings for Geralt. So I want to talk about her a little bit. She is not a very important character for the entire series, considering we know that her and Geralt never meet again, but uh, some of the moments with her bring about important topics, important points that I think are worth mentioning. So at the party when Geralt and Essie first met, Geralt offends her after she asked about Agilvel and the mermaid by saying um, not everyone likes having their problems sung about from the rooftops. So he was basically implying that uh, she was only asking him about that situation about that situation so that she could write a song about it. And it's even said that he felt strangely annoyed by her question. And it's just, uh, it's weird because it doesn't seem like Geralt. And I know he's not a super sweet and friendly guy, but he, he's usually not somebody that's going to initiate bad manners. He's well-mannered. He's just not, you know, the sweetest guy. He's not going to walk up to you and be really nice. He's not going to be rude, though. So I thought that that was a little bit strange, but Dandelion presumes it's because Geralt felt annoyed by Essie thinking that the interest she showed in him came from a morbid curiosity of his otherness. Like, you know, the fact that he was a, like a misfit. You know, he's a witcher. He's not like a normal human man. Um, Geralt rejects this theory, 
but you know, he could just be in denial. I also think he just assumed she was looking for details for a song because he's used to being around Dandelion, who is always looking for the subject of a new song. Yeah, especially when Dandelion said earlier that day that he'd write a ballad about the mermaid, even though he wasn't there. <laughs> he, when uh, Geralt was on the boat translating, Dandelion didn't, um, didn't come along because he said that he gets seasick. But he was like, oh yeah, I'm just going to write a ballad about it anyway. And then later that day they meet Essie and Geralt offends her by saying um, what he says. So that could probably be what triggered him. <laughs> um, Geralt even suspects that she's trying to do that again later when uh, she tells him he's sensitive. He thinks she's trying to make him the subject of a ballad about a witcher with inner conflicts. So he offends her when they first meet by assuming that she was only asking him questions so that she would have the topic for a new ballad or if you want to go with what dandelion says um, about how she was just interested in him because he was you know kind of like a strange dude but either way it was just you know the next day he does it again like he just, you know he's like oh get that out of your head that's not like you don't need to write a song about that about me being a witcher with inner conflicts so that's a just interesting on Geralt's part. Uh, we just see kind of a different side of him, a little bit maybe. So going back to um, what I, how I mentioned that Essie says that Geralt's sensitive, she claims he sympathizes for monsters and worries they will have a moral advantage over him, and he explains this isn't true because the Witcher's code solves all moral dilemmas for him, like his you know refusal to kill members of intelligent races. And we've talked about this in the podcast before. Uh, Geralt's whole code, you know, what he will and will not kill if offered money to do so. You know, he's not going to just kill any old creature just because somebody is willing to pay him. I think even if he's completely broke, like he is a lot of the time, I still think that he would go by this code. However, we really don't know if this is true or not the whole um, inner conflict that he has, the sympathizing for certain monsters or creatures. I think that it probably is. Uh, we, we've seen Geralt conflicted over killing certain creatures, even in hypothetical situations. So I wonder if part of it comes from his code or is some of that a, like a moral dilemma? Like, I feel like I'm talking about this very poorly. I, I think that maybe it's a little bit of both. So Geralt has recognized that he feels, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's sensitive. So I think that's just what I'm trying to get down to. Is Essie right? Is he sensitive? Or is it all just, you know, he's not, he's, he, he has emotions. We know that for sure. They are more limited than the average humans, but most of any displays on his part of showing any sensitivity might not be sensitivity. It might just be this moral inner conflict. And of course, Geralt denies the whole sensitivity thing and he chalks it up to the code while also turning it around on Essie and saying that she's the one who's sensitive, which makes it seem like he just doesn't want to believe it. Like he's in denial again. <laughs> Speaking of Geralt's feelings, He's definitely not over Yennefer. And I've got my examples here, so we're going to talk about that. When he noticed Essie smelled of verbena, he noted he liked the smell, but it was not lilac and gooseberries. And when he's close to drowning, he thinks to himself that if he survives, he'll go back to her in Vengerberg and try again. Uh, although he survives, but he abandons this plan immediately after surviving. <laughs> Uh, he thinks about her when Essie confesses her love for him. He thinks to himself that he won't continue to hate Yen for not being able to give him more than a little sacrifice because Essie's confession makes him realize a little sacrifice is actually a lot. Uh, also, when Essie begins to cry, he comforts her while thinking to himself that he cannot do more because she's not Yennefer. So Essie is crying when she tells Geralt that he, that she loves him and he does not reciproc reciprocate those feelings and 
he doesn't even want to fake it or to do anything to make her feel better because it would just, it, it, because it's not Yennefer. Like those are his thoughts. Like he just feels weird about it because he just isn't, he's not into it if it's not Yennefer. Uh, this also made me wonder if Yennefer wasn't a factor, would he have had feelings for Essie? So let's pretend Yennefer was never even born. They never met. They never had that crazy relationship. And Geralt meets Essie under the same circumstances. And she is said to be beautiful. She's obviously intelligent. She's witty. She seems like a catch. And, and she's a very talented singer. It's just, you know, she, she's got a lot of good stuff going for her. I do wonder if Geralt would have had feelings for her. I think that he probably would have. I mean, we don't know. There's no way to know. But I don't think if he did, I don't think he would have fallen in love with her immediately like Essie did. And I think that's because he's a witcher and because his feelings are more limited. But I think that he maybe could have had something there with her, which could have been better for both of them in the long run. I mean, we don't know yet at this point in the whole Witcher series books what happens to Geralt later down the line. I, mean, I don't know if we, we don't know at this point where his uh or what his future beholds for him, but we do know that Essie dies. Maybe she wouldn't have been in Vizima. She died in Vizima during a, a, a small pox epidemic. And you know, maybe she wouldn't have been there if things worked out with her and Geralt, but yeah, I'll never know. It's just a shame. It kind of makes you wish that he never met Yennefer. <laughs> like he had the opportunity to be with this nice girl. I don't know, but for all we know, he probably wouldn't, he, he might've felt the same way. The whole Yennefer thing, even if he wasn't thinking about her, he still might not have felt anything for Essie. All right, so I want to move on to talking about this group called the Rangers that we learn about in this story. They're also known as the Guardians of the Forest, and they are a volunteer group whose mission was to eradicate forest-dwelling non-humans, including elves, of course, Spriggans, Rizalkas, and Eerie Wives. And I think that this is worth pointing out because we just continue to learn about the hate towards non-humans in this world, and here's just yet another example. <laughs> Uh, at least, though, I will say there are people who are opposed to this sort of thing. It's not like the entire human race is against all non-humans and wants to take them out. You know, Geralt and Dandelion are an example of people that are not for this. Um, we learn about them in the very beginning of the story. So Geralt and Dandelion ended up in Bremivord with no money because Dandelion was singing a song at this fair about the rangers and he was basically just talking crap in the song and that that caused a big fight so there was a you know a huge brawl and there was um a lot of property damage and the uh I forget what they were referred to as but basically like the local law enforcement they knew dandelion so they didn't get arrested for it but they did have to pay a fine and that ate up the rest of their funds. And that is how they ended up with no money by the start of this story. But that story was mainly told for us to learn about why they have no money and why them being broke the whole time is such an inconvenience. But we also just get another example of the just racism. Uh, it's very explicit in this world and it's just a, uh, it's sad. It seems like wherever you go, there's people that have got issues with elves. And then we also learn about these other creatures. I mean, I think Spriggans are like a form of a monster, but still, I mean, and maybe they're not in this world. Maybe they're peaceful and they mind their own business. If you leave them alone, they leave you alone. But yeah, there's a group dedicated to wiping them out and they're not even witchers. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about Dandelion just a little bit. We see a whole new side of him in this story, like this very sensitive side. And I know I've said the word sensitive a lot in this episode so far, and I apologize for that, but it's super relevant and that is why I keep saying it. Uh, so we see him looking for a gift for Essie's birthday, which was really nice. I would never have thought up to this story 
I would never have thought of him as the type of guy that would have this old friend that he's known for a long time. He thinks of her as like a sister and that he would remember her birthday and make it a priority to get her a gift and to try to find her something nice because he doesn't have the money to pay for it. And also he buried her with her loot and the pearl that was given to her kind of by Geralt, kind of by Dandelion. And that was really sweet because you know, she died during this epidemic and they said that, you know, they were burning all the bodies and mass outside the city and he carried her far away into the woods and made sure that she was buried with the things that she wanted to be buried with. And that was just really nice. And you, you sort of look at him in a whole new light because up till now, we've just kind of thought of him as Geralt's funny yet very inappropriate friend. <laughs> and he's got, a, he, he's, he provides a lot of comic relief, but he also is... Kind of a, I don't want to say anything that's, I don't want to be too harsh, but I mean, he's kind of like a womanizer and that, that's obviously not cool. So yeah, he, he's kind of a, a butthead. <laughs> Trying not to curse. So that's the word I'll go with. But he does have this nice, sweet side to him. And I thought that that was cool. And we got to learn more about that in this story. Whereas before he was kind of a, one or two what do they call it a one dimensional two dimensional character you know what i mean but that's how we saw him up until this story all right i'm gonna start wrapping this up i've got my closing thoughts i'm realizing though that i haven't been recording for that long <laughs> and i'm really surprised i know i've talked about this in past episodes how i have this issue of not really recording as long as i would like to and sometimes it's because a chapter or a story is pretty short maybe not a whole lot happens but this story, I really thought that I was going to have more to talk about, or I thought the notes that I had, I don't think I left anything out that I thought was worth mentioning. I thought was worth going into detail about. So, um, I don't know how I managed to make this so short, <laughs> um, especially because it's my favorite story. I thought that this is going to be one of my longest ones, but it's okay. They're going to get longer. Well, you know, I hope... Hopefully you wouldn't mind they get longer, but once we start with Blood of Elves, and I think I've said this before, so I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but maybe you haven't heard me say this, or maybe you forgot. When, once we get to Blood of Elves, I anticipate that these stories, or I mean these episodes are going to start getting longer because it's a, you know, these are like sequ it's a sequential thing. Like, it's not just, you know, one story and you know, you've got the whole thing and then it's over and there's not really a lot to talk about outside of that because we've had the beginning, middle, and end. And that will not be the case once we start with the next book, Blood of Elves. <laughs> All right, so to wrap this up, Geralt and Dandelion went separate ways at the end of the story. And I really liked Geralt having a friend around, but I guess it is time he moved on and did his own thing again. I don't think that those witchers pal around with their friends. I don't know that for sure, but it just doesn't seem like, a, like that would be a normal thing. But yeah, I really wanted Dandelion to stick around with Geralt after his breakup with Yennefer, just because going through a breakup is the worst, and going through a breakup alone is even worse than the worst. So uh, it was nice that they were together for at least the amount of time that they were. But yeah, they gotta live their own lives, do their own thing. They can't be together all the time. And it's also a little bit disappointing because now we see Dandelion in this whole new light. So, you know, we're going to be missing out on further character development there for a little bit, probably. I don't imagine he would be in the next story if they parted ways at the end of this one, but there could be a big time jump. Maybe they will. I don't think so, though. <laughs> uh, last thing. I'm waiting for a return of Yennefer. I don't think that we have seen the last of her. I'm not saying that she will return. I know, I know that you know. I've read all these books already. But I'm just, I'm thinking about this from everything that we've known to this, from this story prior to it. All the stories that led up to this one, I'm looking at it from that perspective as if I haven't read ahead. So based on what we know up to this point, it doesn't look like we're done with her or that Geralt's done with her. I think it's, and I'm basing this off of how often she's been mentioned since A Shard of Ice. A Shard of Ice was a story where they broke up. That was the last time she was in this book. 
and she just keeps coming up. She came up multiple times in the last story, very briefly, but I mean, this, I, I talked about this last episode, like that story was mainly about doo-doo and dainty. Like Geralt was just kind of along for the ride and we're still hearing about Yennefer. And in this story, she was really brought up. Like she was a big part of Geralt's whole feelings and the whole thing with Essie. And so I think it would be unlikely to not see her again in these books. I don't know if that means she'll be in the next story. That'd be kind of exciting. Or if it's going to be a little while, but I think she's going to come up again from how she's being written. All right. That's all I got for you guys. So thank you so much for listening. And if you didn't know, these podcasts are available. Well, I do know that you're aware of at least one of them or you wouldn't be hearing me say this. <laughs> they are available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all under the same name, Sam Fiction and Fantasy Fun. You can watch and listen to me talk about this stuff on YouTube, um, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. It's just the audio. So thank you again and goodbye.